Is anyone else been noticing the massive spiders that have been trying to get into our homes recently? Now I know it's coming up to spooky season, festive and all that, and they deserve somewhere warm to stay for the winter too, but does it have to be in my bath drain? Every time I go to run a little bath, oh, one pops up. <laughs> now I know we have a lot of Australian listeners who are probably saying, Megan, big spider, you haven't got a clue. When I say spider, you say huntsman spider. Spider? You know. Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for episode 36, part two of Killer Weekend. Each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. No, I wasn't having a fit for first time listeners. That is just my normal intro. If you like all things supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory, and all that good stuff in between, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every Friday with our true crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. I will also leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. It does involve details of violent crime and also domestic violence. If that's a trigger point for you then please feel free to turn away now. Just don't look, I'll see you again another day. If you joined us for Friday's episode part one of the brutal murder of Sophie Toscan du Hi, hello there. If you didn't see the last episode, you silly goose, this is part two. What are you doing here? I'll leave the link up here for you. So, I hope you're all well. I hope you enjoyed part one. I can hear you screaming at me right now saying, hurry up, Megan, we've been waiting for this. So, of course, I will do my job. Tonight, everyone, we will be discussing the brutal murder of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. Now everyone, where we left it off last week was the discovery of Sophie's beaten body by her neighbour Shirley Foster at her home in Tourmoor. Shirley, upon discovering poor Sophie, started honking her horn on her car, hoping that her husband, Alfie Lyons, who lived at the top of the road, would hear her and run to her rescue. Alfie unfortunately didn't hear her, all the windows were closed because it was winter, and she had to then run up to the home on foot. When Shirley arrived, at the home she told Alfie what she had found and they both called local police. Now the police in this area of Ireland are called Garda Shiakana which loosely translates to Guardians of the Peace. They are often nicknamed the Guardi by locals and that is what I will refer to them as. Now as per always in unsolved crimes the police work in this one will literally make you want to gouge your own eyes out but let's remember this was over 25 years ago and hopefully things have been improved since then. Hopefully. When police arrived on scene, it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that they were out of their depth. Locals soon heard rumours of a hit and run, but to Gardi, this was obvious. Cold-blooded murder. From the get-go, they appeared overwhelmed and were instructed to await the local state pathologist arriving onto the scene. They also had to wait on the CSI team to arrive from Dublin. Now, this was during the festive period, so anyone travelling from the main cities into the countryside would have been stuck in hours of festive traffic. However, you're probably thinking, a few hours isn't too bad, right? wrong because Dr John Harbison who was the only state pathologist and if you think about the amount of crimes that occurred in the 90s this man was responsible for all of those crime scenes. On the day of the 23rd of December 1996 when Sophie's body was discovered the state pathologist John Harbison was actually celebrating his 61st birthday and he was over seven hours away. So everyone's probably sitting thinking the minute he got that call he jumped in his car and headed to the crime scene yes no he did not he thought he would enjoy his birthday and therefore sophie's remains were laying in the cold for over 28 hours the guardi received much criticism for this but if i'm honest it wasn't really their fault or Dr. John Harbison's fault because for years he had been asking for a second in command. His job role had been spreading him extremely thin for a long time. Dr. John Harbison would soon receive a second in command in the form of Dr. Marie Cassidy, the amazing writer of the book Beyond the Tape that we spoke about last time. But this wouldn't come to pass until 1997 and unfortunately in 1996 he was drowning in work. 
Thankfully, due to the cold Irish winter air, Sophie's remains weren't affected as much as they could have been. However, there was one thing that was affected, and that was time of death, leaving a massive question mark over the timeline of Sophie's murder. Also, even though Gardy would later excuse the fact that Sophie's body was in optimum conditions because it was cold outside, we also need to remember what winters are like there, and it must have been extremely windy. We're talking fibres getting blown away, possible hairs, possible trace DNA. Gone. Another downfall to these delays is that the news never sleeps and once the news of Sophie's murder hit local news it wasn't too long before it reached the French televisions of Sophie's family. And disgracefully enough, this is actually how Sophie's family discovered that she had been murdered. They heard that a French woman had been murdered in West Cork and they were thinking to themselves how many French people would have been out there during this time of year. Sophie's mother, Marguerite, said that she got a gut feeling that it was her baby girl. Sophie's family then decided to contact local neighbours of Sophie and they unfortunately confirmed the sad news. At around 11pm that night, almost 13 hours after Sophie's body had been discovered, the CSI team had arrived from Dublin and they weren't really given any information as to where the scene was. They kind of stumbled around and even had to use a payphone to try and get in touch with the right people. It was said that this crime scene was just a bit of a mess so they had to therefore go to the scene on their own and work in the dark. Not ideal conditions for an investigation. Once the CSI team had done all they could and wanted to pack up and head home for the night, they were told that the body would be laying out all night until Dr John Harbison arrived. They didn't really agree with this. They thought that she should be in some sort of cover or at least taken to a local mortuary, but that wasn't available and they were essentially told to be quiet and get on with their own jobs. John Harbison wouldn't arrive until Christmas Eve the next day and this meant that there was no definitive time of death for Sophie. The cause of death, however, was clear from the scene. Sophie was wearing a pyjama a top, pyjama leggings, a pair of hiking boots that were partially laced and also a house coat or a dressing gown or a robe for some of you. I know everyone calls it something different. To me, it's a coat you wear in the house but we won't fight over it. Sophie's pyjama top was caught on some barbed wires and brambles that were in the bushes next to the gate. On her hands were some defensive wounds that were probably caused by the barbed wire when fighting with her attacker. Next to Sophie's body lay one piece of concrete slate and a large concrete block with Sophie's blood on them. Sophie's pathologist had determined that her cause of death was blunt force trauma. It was believed that Sophie was hit over the head over 50 times times. At first, Gardie believed that they may have some viable evidence such as blood and hand smears on the gate where Sophie was murdered. They also found a clump of human hair in Sophie's hand. So those were sent off to be tested in the hopes that they would bring some justice. The investigators also thought that from where Sophie was found, her isolated hillside home would hold the answers that they were looking for. They couldn't have been more wrong. When Gardy approached Sophie's home, they saw a bright red smear next to the door handle of one of the doors. Now, the front and back door were both locked and in the inside of the home, Sophie's keys remained in one of the doors. However, these doors had a latch mechanism so that if you closed them, you would instantly be locked out of them and they believed that perhaps Sophie had fled from the home, locking herself out and leaving her keys behind. Upon entering the home, investigators soon realised that there wasn't much to find. The home was essentially pristine. Was it too clean? Is it possible someone cleaned up after the murder? We just don't know. Sophie's bed had appeared unslept in. There was also items that had been freshly washed at the sink of Sophie's kitchen. Sophie caramel coloured coat hung on the hook of the door and it still hangs there today in 2021. They also, like I said, found freshly washed dishes in the kitchen sink and along with that was two wine glasses that had been turned upside down. Now, it has been heavily disputed by the Gardaí that these dishes were ever there. However, we have crime scene photos that would suggest that they were there. 
Meanwhile, back in France, with the confirmation of Sophie's demise, her family packed up their things and headed through to Cork on Christmas. Daniel, Sophie's husband, said that he had no desire to join his mother and father-in-law and his stepson to view the body and that he was too devastated to do so. Now, there's been a lot of controversy on this and whether Daniel is suspicious for not going and viewing Sophie's body and I've heard two different sides of it. In my usual nosy fashion, I decided to do some digging and even ask some of my family and friends what they thought. Now, it seems like the general consensus is yes, it's a little bit selfish, let's be honest, to allow your elderly mother-in-law and father-in-law and your little stepson to go and make that identification is quite a selfish thing to do. I mean, yeah, but let's be honest, being selfish is not a crime. There was a lot of talk about Daniel Toscan Duplantier and whether he could be capable of something like this and it would also come into question as to whether Daniel was faithful to Sophie during the time in their marriage because only one year after Sophie's murder, Daniel was married to a 29 year old named Mileta Nikolic who he later would go on to have two children with. It later came to light that Daniel was indeed having an affair with his 29 year old mistress and quite a serious one too as in the July of 1997 only seven months after Sophie was brutally murdered the two found out they were expecting a baby girl. Also and please do take this with a pinch of salt in 2004 it was reported by the Irish examiner that someone else was expecting Sophie. The Irish examiner said that according to Sophie's autopsy report, she was only a few weeks pregnant and with whose baby? We may never know if this is true, but perhaps Daniel was hiding something. Maybe he was ready to move on with wife number four, but wife number three was still in the way. Daniel already had three children from previous relationships at this point. Is it possible that he was terrified at the thought of paying another woman alimony and not only that, child support? The guardie naturally looked at the husband and wondered this too. However, Daniel was said to have had a watertight alibi. He was allegedly in the countryside in France at the time of Sophie's murder. But it should also be mentioned that Daniel was very close friends with French President Jack Chirac and that he was never formally interviewed by the local guardie. Irish authorities arrived in France to interview the family but they were turned away and told no 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 not today. It's common knowledge that at the time Jack Chirac was a very powerful man and that's all I'm gonna say. Despite Daniel's ironclad alibi, a few people dispute this and say that possibly he could have hired someone for the job. I mean, I know there's a few people I'd do for free. That's not what I meant, that came out wrong. Now, let's take a look at the scene of the crime and the murder weapon and see what evidence could have been drawn from this. Now, we obviously had the gate. However, the smears on the gate and the partial handprints were that of Sophie herself. It's believed that while she was being attacked, she grabbed onto the gate for support. So there we are, there's a dead end on that. We also had the clump of hair in Sophie's hand that they believed was from Sophie's attacker. It wasn't allegedly, Gardy would later claim this was Sophie's own hair. Hmm. The stone slabs that were used to attack Sophie are porous in nature and therefore physically impossible to get any sort of handprint off of. The blood that was ingrained in these stones was all Sophie's as well. There was no skin, no blood cells under Sophie's fingernails. This person was like a ghost. The immaculate crime scene does kind of look back to that of a professional hit. Someone who could kill someone and leave absolutely no trace. However, looking at the crime scene, Sophie was beaten over 50 times with one of the blocks and this would suggest something like a crime of passion, someone angry, a frenzy killer and that doesn't really seem like the motive of a trained killer does it? Especially the fact that they didn't choose to bring along their own murder weapon and they had to get creative on the scene. There's also never been any electronic financial trace to prove that Daniel did anything to have his wife murdered. However, 
There is also a few ice cream vans in Glasgow who don't take card payment and it doesn't mean they are not getting paid behind the scenes if you know what I'm saying. But if we rule out Daniel, who else have we got? Sophie's ex-lover, Bruno Carbonet, the tortured artist who was kind of nasty to Sophie and even lovingly left her a screw in the mail. Don't say I never got you anything. Bruno did admit that he was bitter over the split. He even admitted low-key stalking Sophie, but Bruno claimed that he had a watertight alibi, which he did. He had a ticket that proved that he was in Paris at the time of the murder. Okay, so it's not Bruno. Could it be bachelor number three? Sorry, that's inappropriate. A German man who lived near Sophie at the time of her death, who was a musician named Karl Heinz Warney, he was really overlooked by police, it seems, and by everyone else. In all of the documentaries that I've watched and the podcasts I have listened to, there is no mention of this man. It was stated in an official report by the DPP, Director of Public Prosecution prosecutions in 2001 that Sophie was indeed having a relationship with Carl and had visited him that winter in 1996. Carl Warney, who was married himself when he moved to Ireland, was recently living alone and only a short ways away from Sophie, one mile to be exact. On the night of Sophie's demise, it was said that he was playing a show with his band in local Crookhaven, only 20 minutes away from Sophie's home. He claimed that he got in his car after the gig and headed home and stayed there for the remainder of the evening but he was living alone at this time so no one can confirm or deny this. Could Sophie's mystery man be the drinker of one of the two cleaned wine glasses? We'll never know because unfortunately despite being a viable suspect, Carl took his own life in the February of 1997. A close friend of Carl's a few days prior to his death said that when he was drunk he started sobbing and said I've done something terrible. Is it possible he took the secret of what happened to Sophie to his grave? I mean he only killed himself two months after her death. It's very apparent the local guardie didn't find this suspicious at all because a few days after Sophie's death they had already set their sights on another suspect, a local journalist named Ian Bailey. Ian, who was 39 at the time of the murder, was born in 1957 in Manchester. Little is known about Ian's younger life apart from the fact that he had a sister and that in his early 20s he decided on a career in journalism. Ian, pretty much like Sophie, had always had a passion for literature and cinema and at the age of 34 in 1991 decided to make a move to Ireland where he met his long-term partner Jules Thomas. Their relationship began strictly platonic. He was her tenant and rented a guest house from Jules but pretty soon she was swept away by his charm and the young artist fell in love with Ian Bailey. Jules, who was an artist by trade, also had three daughters from a previous relationship but the dynamic between she and Ian wasn't the romantic affair that you would expect from the love between a writer and his artist. It was far from it. It was quite violent. Only a few months prior to Sophie's murder, Ian would attack Jules in a drunken rage which would leave her with a permanent turn in her eye which she had to have surgery on. Despite the fact that Ian attacked Jules in front of her daughters, she decided to stand by her man. However, However, this would not be the last time that his ugly, violent temper would show itself. Ian would go on to attack Jules a further two times, the last being in 2001. Jules would also claim that these attacks were the byproduct of years of suspicion against Ian for the murder of Sophie. It was stress that led him to drink and it was the drink that led him to be violent. However, we now know this is not true because he was a violent man before the murder. Is it possible he was violent enough to commit this act on a complete stranger? Or perhaps maybe Ian wasn't a stranger after all. You see, in the aftermath of Sophie's killing, he seemed pretty familiar with her home. In fact, on the day Sophie's body was discovered, 
Ian and Jules had driven out to Tourmore to Sophie's home so that Ian could document the crime as part of the local press. Ian claimed that he'd been contacted by a member of the Irish Examiner newspaper, Eddie Cassidy, and told that a young French woman had been murdered in the nearby town. However, Eddie would later go on to contradict this and said that he never mentioned that the woman was French. So where did Ian get his information from? And once he hung up the phone with Eddie Cassidy, why did he then choose to drive straight to the murder scene? Was he aware of something that we weren't? Several witnesses would later say that Ian was offering out photos of the crime scene at 11am before he even received the phone call from Eddie Cassidy. Ian was due to deliver a turkey to a neighbour that day but he called them at 11.30 allegedly to say that he couldn't, there had been a murder and that he was to cover the crime as part of the local press but at this point no one even knew about the murder in the press. During this time, remember, it's 1996, there was no such thing as call logs or mobile phone logs, so we are literally just relying on the testimony of strangers. And people can get things mixed up. We don't know when they were approached by Gardi, but some of these statements were taken literally years later. So take everything with a pinch of salt, I would say. When Ian and Jules arrived at the scene of the crime, Gardi would later state that Ian was behaving kind of sheepishly. Jules was the one getting in and getting all the photos as directed by Ian but they said that Ian was kind of like hiding behind his car door and just being very awkward. He wasn't asking them questions and he wasn't acting with the tenacity that a local news reporter would be with such a big crime. After visiting the crime scene Ian seemed to go on a rampage writing about Sophie. Now most of it was complete nonsense. He labelled she and her husband as swingers and said they had an open relationship. I mean, we don't know their business, but he didn't know it either. There was also insider details that Ian himself shouldn't really have known about and these featured in his article for the Daily Star on the 28th of December. In this article, Ian claimed that Sophie was killed by blunt force trauma and that she had also not been subject to sexual assault. He claimed to have seen the two wine glasses on the draining board and this was information that no one knew. So did Ian know this information about how Sophie Sophie died because he had a leak in the guardie telling him things or is it possible Ian knew these things because he was the killer? It's safe to say Ian was acting erratically after the murder. Only two days after Sophie's remains were found, Ian Bailey attended an event called the local Christmas swim. During this event, Irish locals will take a dip into the freezing cold Irish sea as a little way to ring in the new year. Everyone attends and even if you're not going to get in the water, everyone is there to support the people who would. During this event, Ian wore his signature long black coat and detective style black hat, ringing any bells from episode one and the man that Marie Farrell claims to have seen following Sophie. A local woman who was filming the event went up to Ian and asked him for a nice Christmas message to which he responded oddly with, speak to my lawyer. No one's accusing you of anything at this point, Ian, but okay. Ian was always one step ahead, but not in a good way. It seemed like he knew insider information before it was released to anyone else. He began telling people that he believed that Daniel Toscan Duplantier had hired someone to murder his wife. He said that they were experiencing marital problems and that Sophie was having affairs. Very, very broad claims for someone that he allegedly never met. He was also seen arriving at Alfie Lyons, Sophie's neighbour's home, to deliver him some eggs when Alfie had never arranged for him to do so. It seemed to Alfie that he was using this as an excuse to revisit the scene of the crime. During a reconstruction of Sophie's whereabouts on her last few days for television, Ian popped out of nowhere and started talking to the actress playing Sophie, bragging that he himself had seen Sophie up at Three Castle Head 
prior to the day of her murder. It just seemed like he was trying to insert himself into this crime at every corner he could. Is it possible that Ian would later lie about never seeing Sophie before? Alfie Lyon sure said he did because he said that he himself had introduced Ian to Sophie. One day he was delivering something to Alfie and Sophie was down the road in which he went over to introduce the two. So Ian did know Sophie. He just said that he didn't. Sophie's friend Agnes Thomas, who lived back in France, stated that when Sophie was on the phone to her the night before her murder, she was claiming that she was going to meet a man regarding a documentary, a documentary about domestic violence. She said that she never stated the man's name, but she said that he was a very tall man and he made her feel quite uncomfortable. She said that he was very keen on her, a little bit too keen, and Agnes had warned Sophie, don't go and meet this guy if he makes you feel uncomfortable. But Sophie, ever the fearless woman that she was, stated that no, she would go to meet him. Is it just irony that Sophie was going to meet a local man about a domestic abuse documentary? and Ian himself had been accused of domestic abuse before. Some would later go on to say that Sophie mentioned Ian by name, but I really don't believe that to be true and I totally understand if her family and friends are just desperate for an arrest at this point, but it has to be the right person behind bars. In this case, people coming out of the woodwork years later was unfortunately a theme. Almost 10 years after filming that infamous Christmas swim video, Florence Newman decided to make a statement to Gardy. Now, I don't know about you, but I could not tell you if one of my best friends had a slight scratch on their hand or anything like that 10 years ago, let alone a complete stranger. Florence came forward to Gardy and stated that whilst Ian was making his weird you can talk to my lawyer statement, she noticed as he took his hand out of his pocket to shake her own hand and wish her a Merry Christmas that he was covered in scratch marks. But because she didn't come out with this until 10 years later and there was no photographic evidence of these scratches, many do believe that her statement was coerced by Gardy. Local shop worker Marie Farrell, the woman who claimed to have seen Sophie inside her shop being followed by a man in a long dark coat and black hat, also claimed to have a secret to share. Anonymously, Marie Farrell had made two phone calls from a local phone box to Gardy. She stated that she saw a man who matched the description of the man who was following Sophie on the Kilfada Bridge in the middle of the night on the night Sophie was murdered. Marie, who at the time used a fake name and a phone box so she would remain untraceable. Any of you 90s kids remember using a phone box, trying to call your mum before your 50p would run out while dealing with the smell of urine and cheap booze? The anonymous caller who claimed her name was Fiona, said that when she was out and about in the early morning hours of the 23rd of December 1996, she and the man that was accompanying her in the car drove past someone who was behaving very strangely. The man was allegedly drunk it seemed and he was waving his arms. After a local appeal on the television, the woman made a phone call from her home phone and it was traced back to Marie Farrell. Marie Farrell's statements would, to me, suggest one of two things. One, she is the unluckiest person in the world to have encountered this crazy man twice in one week who she had allegedly never seen before. And two, she was perhaps a filthy liar. Marie claimed that she was so shy in coming forward previously because on that night in 1996, she was being a naughty little girl. Marie had told her husband at the time that she was going on a girl's night out and she wasn't going on a girl's night out. She was going to meet up with a man. Now, Marie would say that he's just a friend. Say he's just a friend, baby, you. Chun, worried that her husband would find out about her friend and end their marriage, Marie decided to keep it to herself and phone anonymously as Fiona. Marie would also later say that Ian knew she saw him that night on Kilfada Bridge and that he would often turn up at her shop and make throat-cut gestures to her 
warning her against coming forward. However, it must be said that Marie wasn't the only person who seemed to think that Ian was a cold-blooded killer. Aside from Gardy, a young couple who Jules and Ian had met on New Year's that year said that Ian had gotten very drunk and that Ian had started saying that he had gone too far and began sobbing. Now, Obviously, we know that he attacked Jules in the months before this. Perhaps he was alluding to that. It's all very grey area there. However, someone else's testimony wasn't so grey area. It was very cut and dry. A young 14-year-old boy named Malachi alleges that he met Ian outside of a pub and that Ian had offered to drive the young boy home, which was a normal thing. It's a very small town. Everyone knows everyone. He then said that Ian, who was quite drunk behind the wheel, started confessing to murdering Sophie, saying that he bashed her brains in. Another friend of Ian Bailey, called Billy, claimed that when he had tried to approach the subject of the crime to Ian one day, Ian snapped and then started accusing Billy of the crime. These statements actually had been kind of hidden under wraps by local guard I'm assuming so that they could build a case against Ian Bailey, but they soon made the local press when Ian decided to sue seven news publications for defamation of character. During the libel trial, several of the witnesses had to come forward again and make statements to the judge. Now, a lot of people would say in the documentaries that, oh, they were so unhappy to have to do it. In the news reports from the trial, these people are grinning from ear to ear at the news cameras like they're on a TV show and happy to be there. It does make one question whether they were doing this for publicity or doing it for their five minutes of fame. We never know. You may have noticed that I have changed my jumper because that suit jacket I was wearing was absolutely uncomfortable. A lot of sequins, very scratchy. But anywho, as we were saying, is it possible that their motives behind coming out with these confessions are possibly a little bit more selfish than we were led to believe? My opinion of this was certainly backed up in 2005 when local shop worker Marie Farrell came out with yet another shocking way. Revelation. Marie Farrell came out in a live interview to say that she had only said that she saw Ian Bailey because she was coerced by local guardie. Marie said that the man following Sophie that day outside of her shop was not Ian Bailey. She also said that the man that she saw in Kilfada Bridge the night of Sophie's murder was not Ian Bailey. Are we seeing a pattern here? Yes. Now, obviously we have to take into consideration Marie had claimed that Ian had been threatening her, remember, showing up and doing the cutthroat gesture like a four-year-old in primary school. But now she was telling a completely different story. She was saying that Gardy coerced her and bribed her, essentially, into making those statements. Her prize, you ask? At the time of Sophie's murder, Marie's husband had current pending charges, which miraculously disappeared after she made her statement. It was also said by Marie on the night of Sophie's murder that she was out for a drive with someone who was not her husband, and police had said he won't find out if you do something for us. The man she claimed she was with that night was a man named John Riley, who was a factory worker at the time. This wasn't the only instance of Gardy allegedly coercing false statements. In 2014, an ex-soldier named Martin Graham came forward with his very own story. On May 23rd, 1997, Martin had a meeting with a local journalist in which he claimed that local Gardy had persuaded him with money and drugs to befriend Ian Bailey and try and get his guard down so that they could get a confession. Martin said that he did befriend Bailey but after a while started feeling guilty about it and backed out of the plan. The failure of the guardie would not only extend to the witnesses, but to the crime scene itself. There's been a lot of talk about the gate at the bottom of Sophie's Road that was taken for DNA analysis. Now, it's said a lot in the media that this was lost. However, to this day, the guardie claimed that the gate was not misplaced, but in fact, thrown away 
deliberately. When they had done their testing on it back in 1996, they decided that they couldn't find anything, so what was the use for it? It was a large item and it was taking up too much space, so they got rid of it. This made me really angry when reading about this because with the advances in science and phenotyping DNA and touch DNA, so much could have been done with this had it just been kept. And not only that, Sophie's family said that they would have loved the opportunity to have it tested independently and they weren't even given the option. Is that true or was it lost? Another thing that's not often mentioned because it's quite graphic if I'm honest but I feel like we have to mention it is that Sophie's face actually had a boot print on it. There was a boot print impression on the ground around Sophie and also on her face. However, this is barely mentioned and hasn't even been properly analysed in the sense of Ian Bailey's foot size has never been matched to the shoe print at the scene. Is it because it could have been someone who would wear boots for their trade, perhaps? Such as police boots? There is a lot of contradictory evidence as to what's going on behind the scenes. You see, the whole time they've been investigating this crime, they make such a big song and dance about this missing long black trench coat. They need to find this as they believe it's what Ian wore when the murders were taking place. However, as we learned through the documentary by Jim Sheridan, this coat was actually recovered from Ian and Jules' home in the search of their house back in the 90s. They have that black coat. It's been listed as gathered evidence by the guardie themselves. Now, let's get into the um, concrete evidence that they claim to have. Now, I laughed in absolute awkwardness at this because I was actually ashamed for them. Now, many people mentioned that Ian had scratches on his hands and it was said by many people, including Jules, to be fair, that he had a large scratch on his forehead. When he was taken into police custody to document these scratches, if you can even call it that, they decided that the the best way for them to do it would be to doodle a picture of them. And no, you're not mistaken, these are not the drawings that your toddler drew for you this morning at preschool. These are the official court documented photos of Ian Bailey's injuries. They said the reason for this was that they couldn't get access to a camera at the time. Literally, just go down the street and go to Boots the Chemist. They had many disposable cameras back in 1996. Get anything. Just don't do this. Despite what we think of this police work, which let's face it, is shoddy at best, there are some things that cannot be argued with. Ian's alibi, or therefore lack of alibi, Ian claimed that he was in bed with his partner Jules on the night of Sophie's murder and never got up once. However, when Jules came back and contradicted this and said that she was sure he got up during the night, he then changed his story and said that he had popped along to the guest house he used to rent so that he could write an article. Was it possible he had enough time to sneak out and murder young Sophie? Possibly. Jules also stated that there was a large scratch on Ian's head when he came to greet her with her morning coffee that day. Now, Ian has his own explanations for the scratches on his hands and for the scratch on his forehead. He said that when he was cutting their very own Christmas tree from the field outside their home, he got scratched by the pines. Another key piece of evidence, days after the murder, a neighbour of Jules and Ian claimed to see a fire in their back garden. She said that there was a few items that were undistinguishable, sitting on top of a mattress. Now, Jules and Ian would later come out and say that this was totally false. They had been burning some old furniture back in October of 1996, but this was months before Sophie's murder. Is it possible their neighbour was oddly mistaken? If we're thinking outside of the box on this one and a very popular theory on Reddit and web sleuths in regards to this crime, away from Ian, away from Daniel, away from any of Sophie's many lovers, we have a mystery man, perhaps not known to the public. There's several stories that have come out in the last few years that allegedly Sophie was having an affair with a member of the local guardie. 
there's been many accounts of a man in a blue Ford Fiesta acting strangely on the day of and the days before Sophie's murder. A local man named Martin Sullivan was driving to work on the 23rd of December at 7.30am. On a small narrow road, another car, a blue Ford Fiesta, came towards him and he actually had to swerve out of the way to avoid a collision. The Ford itself was coming from the direction of Sophie's home. The other sighting of this car came from a local garage owner on the 3rd of January 1997. He said that he saw Sophie with a man in a blue Ford Fiesta and she came in to get petrol from the garage. He said she got back into the car and the car went away. He said that it was a rental car and it had a red license plate. Oddly enough, despite this evidence coming out a few days after the killing, no appeal was ever made to the public and no one has ever come forward to say that they were the one driving this car. So if it wasn't Ian, because Ian didn't drive a blue Ford Fiesta, who could it have been? Not everyone believes this theory, including Sophie's family. Sophie's son, Pierre-Louis, who is now a grown man, still to this day believes that Ian Bailey murdered his mother. And in 2019, a French court decided to do what the DPP had been unable to. They charged Ian Bailey with the first degree murder of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. After years of impassioned pleas to the public and trying to get this man up on murder charges, Pierre-Louis finally had his answer. It was a guilty verdict. Ian actually failed to attend the trial and he was tried in absentia. Because Ian was tried in France, the charges only hold a great weight to them if the DPP decided to extradite him to France to face these charges, but they chose not to. Sophie's family were left heartbroken again and my heart really goes out to her family and friends. You can see the pain when they're being interviewed behind their eyes. I can't imagine if this was my mum, my sister, my daughter, I would feel the exact same and I understand they want an answer. But is Ian Bailey 100% that answer? In 2014, a member of the Gardaí, who is now retired and has chosen to remain nameless, stated that he doesn't believe that Ian Bailey committed this crime. He does believe the killer is local to the Skull area and that they were familiar with Sophie and perhaps had a close romantic relationship with Sophie, but he believes the crime was sexually motivated. I myself actually did did believe up until a point that Ian Bailey was an innocent man. But whilst reading up on this case, I was reading one particular book that changed my mind forever. In Nick Foster's Murder at Roaring Water, he makes a terrifying connection. While Sophie was visiting India, she became obsessed with the goddess of death, Kali. She would write about it in her diary. Whilst Nick Foster, who also believed that Ian was innocent, was researching this case for his novel, he came across an interview that Ian did in 1997 and what he read made his blood run cold. He saw that Ian had in fact referenced the exact same deity whilst talking about Sophie's murder. This one instance changed Nick's perception of Ian and he is adamant that Ian Bailey is 100% guilty now. Sophie's son Pierre still fights for justice for his mother to have Ian Bailey extradited to face the murder charges that he was given in 2019 and still Ian Bailey is living in Ireland in the town of Skull. He and his long-term partner Jules have actually separated and it's not said as to kind of why they've separated. I think Jules just felt like for years she was tarnished with the same guilty brand that Ian was and this has really affected her in friendships and even in her relationship with her daughters. One of her daughters actually got married very recently and it was said that she refused to come home for her wedding unless Ian Bailey was out of the home. Obviously they have their own complicated past with their history of domestic violence but it's something to be said that this family's lives have been ruined by the guilty verdict that was forced upon 
Ian Bailey. At the heart of this brutal crime is Sophie and in the circus of this case she's been completely forgotten. I felt whilst researching this case so drawn to Sophie. I totally understood what people meant when they said she was like a magnet. You could not avoid her and I really agree with that. Sophie seemed like an amazing person who was really ahead of her time. She really believed that women had more to them than just being chained to a cooker and a thousand percent I think she would have thrived in the early 2000s when things started to change for women. Sophie filled her family and friends lives with laughter, magic and sadly mystery. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Please give it that big thumbs up if you did. Also, if you're feeling fancy, please hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. If you were watching part one and two as a first time viewer and you're thinking, oh, she's not too irritating and her change of clothing halfway through kept it interesting, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every Friday with our True Crime Killer Weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays. I love you all so, so much. Thank you for all your support. It means everything to me and I hope you know that. And yeah, maybe one day we will finally have justice for Sophie Toscan Duplantier. So remember guys, lock your doors, don't talk to strangers, and don't make the same haircut choices that Marie Farrell did. Nobody wins in that scenario. See ya! Oh, I dropped the crumb.